Okay. Um, this is working, I hope. Cool. Hi. Um, I'm Lauren. I am uh, the faculty at NYU in a program called ITP, which stands for Interactive Telecommunications Program. And this sort of arcane and meaningless name basically describes a program where we like to think that we are exploring the recently possible. Um, so it looks like, kind of like this. It's about 200 students on the floor, uh, grad students, and they make things like this. And I started feeling a little self-conscious that there wasn't enough data viz in my presentation, so I included the obligatory um, kinetic penis wall that we have on the floor here. It was made by <laughs> Peiki Sue for all your um, everyday data visualization needs. Um, <laughs> it's a great project. Um, but what I want to talk about today is P5.js. And um, so P5 is a project that I've invo been involved in for about the past two years. And I think, you know, when you see these tools that people make or these libraries, um, I think there's different reasons for doing them. And sometimes it's like uh, there's something you think just needs to exist and it doesn't and it would make your life and everyone else's lives so much better if it did. And so you would just go and make it. Um, or maybe you're just awesome at something and you've made something awesome and you want to like share that wealth and that cool thing with everyone else, you make a toolkit. Um, or maybe it's some part of your ongoing research. Um, and these are all great reasons to make toolkits, but it's not really the reason that I got involved in this project. Um, and in fact, I didn't really ever mean to do this. Um, I guess at some point I did, maybe. But anyway, so what happened was, you know, I was a couple years out of grad school and I was working at Tulsa Limited, as Irene mentioned, and I was making some of my own um, artwork, and I was using a lot of open source tools. And it sort of occurred to me that I would kind of like to contribute and give back a little bit and, and work on some of these tools. So I started trying to do that, you know, tried to join some mailing lists or figure out how I could help. And the, the response I got a lot of times was kind of like, it's, it's too complicated to explain to you, or uh, it, it's too hard, you know, maybe just like uh, answer some questions on the forum. Um, which is a great thing to do, but it's not what I wanted to do at that time. So I kind of gave up. I thought, you know, if I'm really going to get involved here, it seems like I'm going to have to really elbow my way in, and that's not really my personality. I'm not, uh, I don't really like force myself into things like that, um, and at least not social situations. Um, so I kind of let it go. And then uh, a couple months later, I met Casey, uh, our advantage to Casey Reese at a conference. And for those of you that don't know, Casey, along with Ben Fry, uh, created this tool called Processing, um, which they started working on in 2001. And it's a Java-based toolkit uh, whose goal is to make coding accessible to artists and designers and educators and beginners, and also to start to introduce visual literacy to programmers. Um, so this tool has been widely successful and um, you know, it's been going on now for nearly 15 years and um, is taught in academic programs in terms of art and design, but also even in some engineering programs today. Um, and so it looks kind of like this. So you're dealing with Java, but you're not immediately thrown into Eclipse and figuring all that out. And you can really quickly get something cool onto the screen without having to jump through all the hoops that you normally would with Java just to get like a rec to show up. So this was exciting and it was approachable. Um, and so anyway, I, I was talking to Casey and I was kind of mentioning my interest in getting involved somehow, but you know, finding it difficult. And I was saying, you know, I wish there was something I could do about this lack of diversity um, in these communities, but I don't feel like I want to go start a woman coding meetup, although they're great. Um, it didn't feel like my thing. And I didn't feel like I wanted to, you know, I didn't feel like I was going to be an activist or an advocate or someone that's, you know, speaking about these things. And I said, I don't know, you know, what to do. And he said, um, well, maybe you don't need a big plan or a scheme. Maybe if the opportunity arises, you just take it to, you know, do, do something, contribute something, and you can just be one more woman that's involved and, you know, go from there. Um, so I thought, okay, yeah, if the opportunity arises. And so, of course, it did a few days later when he wrote me and said, so, you want to work on processing? Um, <laughs> and I couldn't really say no at that moment. Um, <laughs> so... So what we decided is that I would be uh, a processing fellow, which meant for three months I would work on something related to the project. And at that time, I was really excited about uh, JavaScript because I had like, just learned how to you know, write my first JavaScript program. Um, 
And so for some reason, the Processing Foundation thought I would be like the perfect person to um, reimagine processing for the web. And uh, it was not meant to be a huge project. It was just three months, do some experimenting, make some little prototypes, and you know, there'll be some research. Um, so this was cool. This was it. I finally had my chance. I was going to do something. And so I um, quickly got started uh, spending the next three months doing um, absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, because I didn't know where to start, and I was scared, and I, um, I, you know, I barely knew JavaScript. I didn't really know processing that well, even, and I, I didn't know how to think about making a tool or a library or how to bring two different languages together. Um, and so I mostly spent that time just sending emails, explaining that I needed more time, um, and making excuses. And I think finally, Casey said the same thing. You know, you don't need a whole plan. Why don't you just try and do something? And, and do it by next week, if you can. <laughs> um, and so I did. And as soon as I just got down to it and stopped being so scared thinking about you know, the size of this imagined task, um, I found it was pretty easy, actually. If you don't know very much about JavaScript, it's not too hard to um, write some functions, because you're not thinking about you know, how to make it perform well, or document it, or fit together, or be extensible. Um, so I just started implementing some of these first processing functions, like setting the background, drawing an image to the screen, uh, setting the size of the, of the canvas. Um, and so this was exciting, and it was kind of fun, and it was an experiment. Um, and then I linked up with Evelyn Eastman, and the two of us would you know, sit around and drink champagne and uh, <laughs> um, work on this tool. And she, with the two, we were both going to teach a class at RISD. Uh, intro programming. And so she said, why don't we use this tool? And I thought, what could go wrong with that? Um, <laughs> so it was very in progress. You know, this was like the alpha, alpha, alpha. Um, and we didn't, you know, we just kind of went in there and sat, wrote on the whiteboard, okay, um, install Sublime, go here. Um, and we didn't have all these things like books to teach with or online materials or forums or documentation or a working library. Um, <laughs> but I think that they understood the kind of spirit of it. Um, and so, you know, our, this was our syllabus, or uh, similar to our syllabus, and oh, we always included this disclaimer slash invitation, which I don't know if anyone felt like it was a very cool invitation. But it basically said, like, this might not work. Have fun. Um, but get used to it. And once you get used to it, it will be even more fun. Um, but I think that they understood the spirit, that it was an experiment and that it was exploratory. And their work that the students made with it really captured that. They, they really made things that showed that they were just as fearless, that they were OK with things not working, that they were willing to take risks. Um, and this was exciting. And so at the end of that semester, we realized that um, it, was, it was becoming maybe more than just a three-month experiment, and that maybe we could take this further. And we got some great help from some of the engineers at Boku, which was awesome. Um, and one moment I remember, you know, when we spent a couple of days there just working with people. Um, and we sat down with Ben Allman, and he offered to do a code review for us. And I think if I knew then what I knew, know now, I would have been like mortified to show this code. But I didn't. So I was like, oh, here it is. And, um, and he looked it over very seriously and then came back and said, so you might not want to put all the source code for your library into one file. Um, you might want to develop some guidelines around spacing and uh, you know, equal signs, et cetera. Um, so we looked, you know, looked all these things up. I learned about Grunt. Um, and we started kind of this step forward from taking this from a prototype or a proof of concept to something that could you know, be a little bit more. Um, and the whole time, I, we're kind of like, what are we getting into here? You know, it wasn't ever like, OK, we're going for this. We're doing this. Um, we started getting some support from ITP. Dan Schiffman was very excited about it. He's um, another one of the professors there. Um, and we got some students working with us last summer for, through Google Summer of Code. So this is Sam Levine working on um, the IDE. This is Scott Garner, who worked on some of the intro materials that I'll show in a moment, um, and Jason Siegel, who uh, d has done a lot with the sound. Um, and we would ha I'd have these meetups at ITP every two weeks. And basically, a group of people would assemble um, and then like look at me as if I had some idea what was going on. And um, I would pretend like I did. 
and it was terrifying. And you know, I kept doing this, and then it started to get less terrifying and really cool. And now we have a group of about 20 people that get together every couple of weeks and are kind of like working independently on this. Um, so that's kind of the that's the origin. I think the cool thing was that you know we're all learning together and we're making together. And nobody in this room was a a pro, but we were okay kind of collectively getting on and saying we were going to try to figure it out. And ITP was on that mission also. Um, so what is P5? Uh, I guess I, I wanted to show. So we launched it. We made this kind of really goofy thing, and I just thought I would show a little bit of it. Um, hopefully it's not too safe. Hi, I'm Lauren. And today I'm excited to introduce P5.js. Oh, P5 is a library that takes the core ideas of processing and brings them to the web. So you can do everything you've done with processing, but do it in JavaScript and some new stuff too. All the examples you see here were made with P5, and at the end, you'll be able to see how they work. Here to show you some specifics is Dan Schiffman. Hi. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. My name is Dan, and I'm really thrilled to be here to talk about some of the features of P5.js with you. So what is this P5 thing anyway, and what are the things you might do with it? Well, one of the core features of P5.js is drawing shapes. If you used processing before, it's really just the same. You might draw a circle or a square, a triangle, or a beautiful flower. Flowers are one of my favorite things to draw. But let's put the flower aside, and let's go back to that circle, this nice round circle. How did this circle appear here? A line of code. This line of code. This line of code made this circle appear. And this is the thing you'll need to learn, the syntax, this way of writing code, if you want to draw and design your own shapes. But the thing is, this is real-time software. This is happening right now. This circle can be interactive. You could click on it, and it'll change color. Go ahead, click on it. Watch it change color. This is the code that made that happen. But here's the thing. This is the thing I'm the most excited about in terms of P5. We are here. I'm here in this web browser. I'm not really here, but you know, you know what I mean, right? So uh, the web, it's a powerful medium of communication, and there's all sorts of things you could do on the web. All the things you can do with the web, you can do with P5. So we can start adding HTML elements to interact with, like a slider. We can put a slider here. You can slide it back and forth, and you can change this circle's color. How did this slider appear? A line of code. Create slider. This is, I just I really, really love this line of code. And <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll stop there. So one of the lessons I learned <laughs> is if you want to do a project like this, it really helps to have someone that's very excited on your team. Um, so that's great. Um, so anyway, that's how we introduced it. And um, the idea is that you can use the tools you're familiar with. So you could use your favorite code editor and your favorite browser and just start making stuff in, uh, kind of immediately. And if you're coming from processing, it's very easy to port one to the other. So the language is very similar, although it diverges where necessary. Um, and you know, we're starting with the same drawing metaphor. And so this uh, is an illustration by my friend Taeyun Choi, who's making the drawings for the upcoming Getting Started with a P5.js book. Um, so this is describing the create canvas function, um, which is kind of your starting place. And the idea is that it, it's not just the canvas. Um, so there's it's uh, bringing together JavaScript and HTML5 and CSS and trying to make it so that you don't have to learn everything about this whole stack when you get started. You can just start playing, and then you can go deeper into all of those as you need or as you want. And so we spent a long time um, working a lot on the, on the documentation. So trying to make something that's kind of interactive um, and, and self-explanatory so that you can uh, start playing immediately and see how it works. Um, and then also making a lot of examples that work um, just right in the page. And you can you know, play with these things um, and update and see your changes happen without having to download everything and set it all up yourself. And then if you're kind of interested in it, then you can grab that code and um, drop it into your browser. So trying to make it so that you don't have to wade through Stack Overflow or some very complicated uh, reference or documentation. Um, and then there are new things we had to deal with. So you know, asynchronicity and callbacks. And so you know, there's now a method like load JSON from uh, processing has an, a, a, the ability to take a callback and to deal with that data. 
Um, but then we also have other things like uh, there's kind of two options. So you can use this preload function that's kind of like a promises solution that you can first just call load JSON like you're used to and then use the data later on, later on in your setup and draw functions. Um, we felt like touch should just work out of the box because it's so easy to get it onto mobile and it's one of the things we're excited about. Um, and we are making a lot of examples and really excited about the possibilities of you know, working with web sockets and connecting with uh, a node server and having networked experiences. Um, so this is a thing that's not playing. Um, this is a project by Coven Verdi where it's an interactive soundscape and you play with it on your phone and then it uh, aggregates everyone's interactions into this digital mural. Um, and then the other thing is it should work well with other libraries. So this is a face tracker library. Um, and you can see you can integrate it right in. And this is kind of like a basic mode. So you just start writing and everything is appended into the global namespace. But then if you want to get a little bit cleaner about it, you can wrap it up into what we call instance mode so that all the variables are wrapped up in one namespace and it plays even nicer with other libraries. Um, and then we're building some libraries of our own, so ones that have to do with uh, manipulating the DOM or playing with sound, and we're adding some new ones this summer as well. Um, okay, so I just wanted to try and do a, a quick live demo because I thought that would be like the most potentially disastrous thing I could do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to flip back and forth. I hope that's okay. One of my students told me it gives her a headache when I flip, but um, I'm under a time crunch, so I apologize for the mig migraines. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is what you would do if you were making P5. I've got a bunch of things linked in here, but you know, you link in the library. Here's my JavaScript file. And the basic metaphor um, with processing and with P5 is that you have this setup and draw. Things in setup happen once, and the things in draw loop over and over. Um, and so it's procedur procedural. It's not a scene graph model. So you can, it works really well for drawing programs and things like that. So that's what I'm going to do today. Um, so I'm just going to make a little canvas. Um, and I'm going to just draw something based on my mouse position. And hopefully that works. OK, cool. So we've got that. Um, I could make it look a little bit nicer. Switching the color mode. Um, I'll set the fill color to kind of loop around. Um, and then maybe I'll map the the size instead of just 50 here to the mouse Y. So uh, something like that. OK, so now I've got something that looks a little bit prettier. Um, so that's kind of your basic you know, Hello World program with P5. And then you could get a little bit uh, more into it. So maybe I'll add in uh, like an audio input. Let's say mic equals new P5. And then, um, let's see, we'll just draw this two. And then here, instead of mapping mouse Y, I'll map the mic level. Um, and I'll also do the Y position. So the mic kind of goes from like zero to one, but I'm just going to make sure we get all the way there. OK, so if I did that right, the Ah, ah, ah. Okay, so that's fun. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, so then uh, let's add the webcam. Um, so uh, create capture, and we'll just grab the video so you don't hear the echo back. Um, and I'll set the size to be the same as the canvas. Oops, and I'll set the position zero, 0. I'll make sure this one's at zero, 0. Um, and OK, so now we should have my face in there. <laughs> da, da. OK, that's cool. But it'd be cooler if I could draw with my nose. So <laughs> uh, I'll add a tracker in there. So this is from another library um, that's based on uh, Jason Sarai's face tracker uh, research. 
and it's pretty easy to use and pretty cool. So I just pass in basically the um, capture element into this tracker and I initiate it with a model. Um, and then here I could get uh, the position. So if you look at this library, um, it you can see there's actually like numbers for all these different positions on the face. So I'm going to go with 62, which would be my nose. Um, so something like get position. And then here, we'll keep the audio size mapping. Um, but here, instead of this x and y, I could say something like, you know, get the 62 point and get the uh, x and y position. OK, let's see. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Hey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, OK. Uh, now I feel like I should pass out, but I'll just <laughs> keep going. All right, so that, that's the show me. And there's a whole lot more that you can do. And it's, it's very fun. And there's lots of cool things. So I just wanted to share really quickly um, some of the work that other people are making. Um, so I just. I wish I could show you these all in the browser because there's something exciting about seeing that. But I just made a video so I don't have to um, worry about it all so much. So um, just starting out, this is some student work. So this is from our first RISD class. And so these students have been programming basically you know, one to maybe three weeks. Um, and so they're exploring you know, transformations, working with different media. There's artists and designers in the class and architects. And you can see them each kind of bringing their own um, excitement to it. Uh, this is a piece by Coven Verdi where he searches Instagram. It's a bot. Searches Instagram, finds sunsets, uses P5 to pixel sort it, and then um, posts these prints online on Tumblr. This is by uh, Mark Abbey playing with emoji. Um, this is a piece by Kate Masood that was trying to make a more interactive way for people to explore the Cooper Hewitt collection. This is another piece by Mark Abbey exploring storytelling. So it's a much longer interactive experience, but I'm just showing some clips here. Uh, this is a piece by um, Jason Siegel, Michelle Chandra, Pam Liu, and Ziv Schneider. excited about kind of the diversity of things that you see. It's not one particular um, type of aesthetic or, or um, goal or idea. So what else? So uh, I'm really excited this summer. We have some Google Summer of Code students joining us um, to work on things like adding WebGL and 3D and shader support, uh, finally. Um, adding SVG support and export to PDF. Uh, better mobile integration with things like PhoneGap. Um, exploring serial communication, OSC so that we can connect to things like Arduino or Connect, um, better documentation, and adding a gallery, finally. Um, so that should be cool. The other thing we're doing at the end of May is a, a one-week contributors conference uh, hosted at the Studio for Creative Inquiry in Pittsburgh. Um, so it's going to be a one-week conference where we work on all aspects of P5, um, not just, or including you know, fixing bugs, adding new features, adding documentation, but also things like thinking about outreach, community, design, internationalization, diversity. And this is something that's really important to us and really important to me, thinking of considering the, the place that we started with this project. 
Um, and so this is open to anyone. You know, we have limited funding uh, to cover travel, accommodations, and food. Um, so if you're interested, go to this link and let us know in the form. Um, and we'd love to have you join us. There's no specific skill set that you need to have, just a excitement and interest in being involved. Um, we're also looking for companies that might be interested in supporting the event through scholarships for people that want to come or um, supporting some of our diversity events that we're planning for the week. So you can also get in touch if you're interested in that. Um, so, you know, there's all the technical things, but the thing that's been really, and maybe this is clear from my talk, exciting to me about this project is the social aspect and thinking about how to communicate in line, how to have these conversations and how to set a tone for the community, um, how to be hyper aware on these, you know, GitHub threads, which is not too hard for me because I'm very sensitive. Um, to language that see, might seem kind of aggressive um, because, and understanding that everyone has their own communication style, but together we have to find a way to make sure that everyone um, can express themselves and feel comfortable doing that. Um, so I'm really thankful for the opportunity that the Processing Foundation gave me two years ago. You know, they, they took a chance on me. I didn't know what I was doing and they gave me the chance to learn. And I think this is what's so um, meaningful to me about this project and if anything carries on I hope it's that spirit you know that you don't have to be an expert or a pro or know exactly what you're doing or have a whole plan um, that you could maybe just start doing something and and, um, and, and learn along the way and so um, I know there's still a lot to do for diversity in terms of access to these tools or uh, having the time to get involved at all but I think as a first step, we can make sure that everyone that feels interested uh, in being involved uh, doesn't feel excluded or afraid or unqualified, but feels invited and welcome. And it's really important to me in this project, but I think like all of you today sitting here seeing all these different tools and frameworks, you know, if you are kind of wondering or thinking about getting into it somehow, that you feel um, you know, willing to, you, like you maybe will take a chance, um, because I can say that it's worth it. Um, and, and like Casey told me, you don't need a whole plan. You can just start and, and try something. And as a community, I hope that we can you know, work together to open up this space so that anyone that wants to can have the opportunity to engage, to be a part of it, um, to make, to lead, and to learn. Um, thanks. <laughs>